Today I wanna show you one of the strangest molecules you've ever seen. What if a molecule could move, flip itself inside out and store information like a computer chip? Trifia siuminen is a bizarre ball shaped structure with a unique dynamic behavior that makes it a perfect candidate for the next generation of memory devices. But how is that even possible? To find the answer, let's take a little trip back in time in 2014 at the University of Tohoku in Japan. That's when researchers launched a brand new field called Pi System Figuration. In this field, scientists were developing new Pi system to create organic functional materials. One of them was Tomoyuki Akutagawa, who had already made a name for himself back in 2009 by developing molecular rotator type ferroelectrics. By 2014, he was on the hunt for a new organic material that could show ferroelectricity. If you are not familiar with ferroelectricity, no worries, I'll explain it in detail a bit later. So one day during a meeting group, he came across a molecule that had been synthesized by one of the group members, Professor Hidehiro Sakurai. That molecule was called siuminin. It's got a really cool ball-shaped structure. At the core, there is a six-membered ring fused with the three benzene rings, all connected by CH2 units. And when Professor Agutagawa saw it, he immediately said, this is it. He truly believed that this molecule could induce ferroelectricity. So a new project was launched focused on developing a functional material using siuminin. This project ended up becoming the PhD thesis of Jianyin, one of the students in Akutagawa's group. Jianyin went all in. He synthesized and tested a ton of siuminin derivatives, hoping that one of them would finally show ferroelectricity. But unfortunately, none of them did. After so many failed attempts, Jianyin was frustrated. One day, he turned to his supervisor and said, Oh boss, how many siuminin do I need to bury to get my PhD? That line perfectly captures the pressure PhD students feel when nothing seems to be working. Then one of the group members suggested trying something different, trifia siuminin. In this molecule, the methylene bridge are replaced with sulfur atoms. And guess what? It worked. The new compound actually showed ferroelectricity. So far, we've learned that suminin is a conjugated polycyclic hydrocarbon with a ball shaped structure, and because of its features, we might expect to it show ferroelectricity. But here's the twist it only actually shows ferroelectricity when the CH2 units are replaced with sulfur atoms. So, in the rest of the video, we'll try to answer three big questions. First, why is ball shaped structure even suspected to show ferroelectricity? Second, why doesn't zoom in itself actually show this property? And third, why does it finally show ferroelectricity when we replace the CH2 units with sulfur atoms in trifia suminin? To answer all of this, let's first take a closer look at the unique structure of suminin. Now let's take a look at the chain conformation of cyclohexane. We often forget that its molecule is not static, like we draw it on the paper. In the reality, it's in a constant motion through what's called ring flip or ring inversion where the axial and equatorial positions keep exchanging places. Cyclobutin shows a similar type of motion known as butterfly motion, named because it looks a bit like a flapping of a butterfly's wings. Now let's bring it back to our case. Just like cyclohexane and cyclobutene, suminin is not static either. Instead, it undergoes a dynamic motion called ball-to-ball -ball inversion. To get a clear picture of its motion, let's think about the numbers. The butterfly motion in cyclobutin only takes about 1.45 kilocalories per mole. The ring inversion in cyclohexane is a bit harder, it needs around 10.8 kilocalories per mole. But in suminin, the value is almost doubled. The ball to ball inversion requires 18.2 kilocalories per mole. To really understand how this unique motion triggers ferroelectricity, we first need to ask what exactly is ferroelectricity? Here I'm gonna discuss how compounds containing electric dipoles respond to an external electric field. In the absence of an electric field, dipoles are randomly oriented. However, when an external field is applied, the dipole moments tend to align themselves with the field, creating a net dipole moment. In this diagram, the x-axis represents the external electric field and the y-axis indicates polarization. For some materials, there is a linear relationship between the external electric field and polarization. This means the induced polarization is almost exactly proportional to the applied field. These materials are called linear dielectrics. Outer materials exhibit enhanced non-linear polarization. In such cases, the slope of the polarization curve is not constant, 
Unlike in linear dielectrics, these materials are called power electrics. There is also another class of materials known as ferroelectrics. Like power electric, these materials also show no linear behavior. However, their unique feature is that even when the applied field is reduced to zero, a finite polarization still remains. This property is known as spontaneous polarization. Let's now elaborate on this diagram in more details. Imagine this is a ferroelectric compound. Without applying an electric field, there is no net dipole moment. Now let's apply an external field. As you can see, the dipole moments align themselves with the field. And at some point, the polarization reaches maximum value. Beyond this point, increasing the field further doesn't change the polarization. Next, let's reduce the electric field back to zero. At first glance, we might expect the polarization to drop to zero as well. But in reality, the compound remains polarized, even when the external field is zero. This is the most important feature of ferroelectric materials. It means that most of the dipoles stay aligned with the previously applied field. In other words, ferroelectric seems to have kind of memory. This property is known as hysteresis effect. Now let's increase the electric field again, but this time in opposite direction. At some point we again reach maximum polarization, except now it's in the opposite direction. This is another important feature of ferroelectrics, they can be polarized reversibly. If you reduce the field back to zero once again, the compound is still polarized. By further increasing the electric field in the original direction, we again reach maximum polarization. Altogether, this cycle produces hysteresis loop of ferroelectric materials. There are two key results from this diagram. First, even when the external field is zero, ferroelectric compounds remain polarized. This is hysteresis effect. Second, ferroelectrics can be polarized in opposite direction, depending on the applied field. Now let's connect this physical property to molecules. Remember the ball-to-ball -ball inversion of suminin. Pause the video and try to figure out how it could demonstrate ferroelectric behavior. Here you can see 3 fiosiuminin which shows a ferroelectric response to an external electric field. The ball-shaped aromatic system possesses a dipole moment, within the crystal lattice a supramolecular assembly of these molecules align in a specific direction under the influence of an external electric field. Here, I represent each molecule as a ball stacked together. Due to the ball-to-ball -ball inversion mechanism, when the electric field is applied in the opposite direction, the molecules in the crystal can switch their dipoles and realign with the new field direction. In other words, they undergo reversible electric polarization as a direct result of the ball-to-ball -ball inversion process. Now let's explore why suminin doesn't show ferroelectricity while trifia suminin does. What happens when we replace CH2 unit with a sulfur atom? As you can see, both molecules have a ball-shaped structure, but they differ in depth of the ball. The larger sulfur atoms make the ball shallower compared to suminin. This structural change is what leads to ferroelectric behavior. But why does the ball depth matter? During ball-to-ball -ball inversion, the molecule must pass through a nearly planar structure before flipping to the opposite direction. The planar geometry is a transition state of the inversion process. Molecules with shallower balls can undergo inversion more easily, because the barrier to inversion is lower. In fact, the inversion barrier decreases from 18.2 in suminin to only 1.9 in trifia suminin. This dramatic reduction in energy barrier is the origin of the ferroelectric response in trifia suminin. Let's take a closer look. Here we can see four ball shaped molecules with different depths and we're gonna to compare their inversion barrier relative to ball depths. Suminin has the deepest ball among them with an inversion barrier of 18.2. Curaniolin is another member of this family where five benzene rings are fused to a central five membered ring. Its inversion barrier is 9.2 which is almost half that of suminin. Trifia suminin shows a dramatic drop in the inversion barrier reaching just 1.9. And if you replace the sulfur atom with selenium, the energy barrier becomes zero because the molecule is planar. Now let's go through the synthetic pathway of trifia suminin. The synthesis begins with the triphenylene skeleton with six methoxy groups. In the first step, all six ortho positions are lithiated by NBUD lithium. As you might guess, it sounds like a weird reaction because it doesn't look like a stable transition state. So let's break down what's going on. 
I'm gonna take this dilithiated part of the molecule. This pattern is repeated across the whole pi system, in which two lithium atoms are linked by two pi bonds. Actually, it resembles a classic 1,4 butadiene that can exist in S cis and S trans conformations. The S cis conformation suffers from the clash of the two hydrogen atoms, so the molecule prefers the S trans conformation. But in this case, the 1,4 dilithiobutadiene unit is forced to be in the cis conformation because it's part of the rigid ring system. Interestingly, calculations indicate that 1,4 dilithiobutadiene can create a bridge structure in the cis conformation and this double lithium bridging is highly stabilized compared to the non-bridge geometry. This is why all six ortho positions can be lithiated at the same time in one pot procedure by dropwise addition of n butyl lithium in hexane. Under basic conditions, sulfur powder is added to the reaction mixture to create an intermediate containing two SS bonds. To achieve the desired product, in the desulfurization step, Cu powder is added to cleave the SS bonds, leaving us with the final product. But this is not the end. The point is that substitutions play a crucial role in ball-to-ball -ball inversion. So it's important to install different substituents on the main skeleton to investigate how they affect the inversion process. To do this, we first need to convert the methoxy groups to alcohols. For demethylation, this intermediate reacts with boron triboromide. Firstly, the methoxy group attacks the empty orbital of the boron atom, and one of the bromine atoms leaves as a bromide ion, which is a good nucleophile. The bromide ion then attacks the methyl group, and the bonding electrons move to the positively charged oxygen. As a result, bromomethane leaves the molecule and the new oxygen boron bond is formed. After addition of water, the air sensitive hexahydroxy intermediate is obtained. For the realkylation step, potassium carbonate abstracts the hydrogen of the hydroxy groups, and then alkyl bromides are installed on the molecule via a simple SN2 reaction. In this way, long chain carbon substituents can be introduced on the oxygens. But how do these substituents affect the inversion process? Remember, in the crystal lattice, we have a column of ball structures that stack on top of each other. Here I indicate the long alkoxy chain as a donut shape. The role of this long chain is that it promotes motional freedom, making ball-to-ball -ball inversion easier. Notice that ferroelectricity occurs at Curie temperature. You can think of it like melting butter. Upon heating, the system becomes softer and more flexible. In the same way, long-chain hydrocarbons enhance the flexibility and internal thermal energy of the molecular assembly when heated, which facilitates ball-to-ball -ball inversion. Now let's see how this concept can take memory devices to another level. Computer memory is divided into volatile and non-volatile types. Volatile memory loses data when the system shuts down and needs a constant power source to retain information. Take random access memory as an example. You use it every day. Imagine loading an application and then browsing the internet. Random access memory allows you to quickly switch between these tasks and keep track of where you are in each one. But as soon as the power is off, all the information disappears. Non-volatile memories, on the other hand, can store information regardless of whether the power is on or off. Flash memory is a good example that you also use daily. This property makes non-volatile memories stand out from other type of memories. There are actually different types of non-volatile memories, but ferroelectric non-volatile memory devices are among the most promising for future commercial applications. Remember the hysteresis loop of ferroelectrics. Even when the external electric field is zero, the compound still shows polarization. That means it can be used to store information even when the power is off. Traditionally, inorganic materials like lead titanate are used to fabricate ferroelectric memories. But transition metals are not environmentally friendly, and that's a major limitation. By moving toward small organic molecules like tritiosumine, we can fabricate greener, more effective non-volatile memories. Molecular manipulation could even enhance both efficiency and cost effectiveness, making these devices suitable for future commercial use.